Okay, so for this one, you're going to need a, uh, a pencil and paper because uh, you're going to make a sketch. You're going to draw a line, a couple lines. All right, so what I want you to do is take a look at that little image that's on my uh, screen right there, the max range, or, yeah, max pain range compression. So the idea behind that is there's an enormous amount of energy that's baked into the doji as a consequence of price racing from the top of the hill all the way down to the bottom. And then it compresses into that doji and then it's going to cross that blue line, the line of departure. And then if it stays within the doji, it's in the yellow zone. I don't have a directional view of it. But if it goes left, green, that's good. Red to the right, that's bad, unless I'm short. So it's just going to make some kind of directional move that stops the doji. It's out of the doji's um, channel, if you will. All right. So now I want you to. So I want you to hold that thought. I want to, what I want you to hold the thought is, where does the energy for everything after that blue line come from? It's supercharged by the size of that doji. So, or the, uh, by the supercharged by the size of the max pain. So you know that it is in play at least to that level of energy, that it moved price that far. Work was performed. All right. Now I want you to think about a bicycle. By any definition, a bicycle is a system. It's a pretty good system. It's robust. It's reliable. It's purposeful. It's functional, you could describe it, it's reliable. Now the thing about a bicycle is that it is inherently unstable, right? So if you just try to just set a bicycle on the ground and then take your hands off it, it's probably going to fall over because it is really, really optimized to be stable when it's moving. In fact, the faster that you push a bicycle, the more stable it is. Like if you want to ride hands-free, it's easier if you're going faster because it is the, the extra energy is making it be the best bicycle it can, and the wind that's passing on either side of it actually keeps it stable because it's symmetrical along the long axis of the bicycle. So the faster the bicycle goes, the more stable it is. And then if you stop pedaling and it starts slowing down, it starts to wobble and then it will fail and then it will fall. So now what I want you to imagine is we have a, a test track and we place a bicycle on the top of that big red candle and we have a little channel within which the wheels are going to run. So this thing is going to go screaming down the hill, picking up energy, hits the flat land into the doji, and it's in that channel of controlled pathway. It's already done. It cannot vary its path from the left-hand side of the vertical blue line. So it has a certain amount of energy, and when it crosses that blue line, the straps come off and now it is free range chicken. It is a free range bicycle. Now on your on your paper I want you to put a little dot where the bicycle uh, re receives its freedom from the doji. It crosses that blue line and in your mind I want you to imagine one use case uh, of what that bicycle does. Draw the path of what you think that bicycle might do until the moment that it falls and when it falls put a little dot and then take a look at the path that you drew and imagine feeling what it felt like to be the bicycle and all the forces on it as it began to slow down and friction and wind and lack of energy and then wobbling and then crash. Uh, when you have finished drawing that line give me a thumbs up. You should be just about done with that line just about now. Now, uh, that's trade number one. 
pick up your bicycle, dust it off, clean it up, make it as close to the first bicycle as you could, or if you want to be perfect, you now have a thousand bicycles that are as identical as Japanese manufacturing can make them, and they come out of the factory shrink wrap, and they're at the top of the hill, and now they're going to now take the second one, run it down and out through the doji, now draw another path, bearing in mind that the first path has no impact on the second path because each uh, each by bi the bicycle has no memory or if you will each subsequent bicycle is born with no memory and off it goes <clears throat> now imagine you did that a thousand times I want you to sketch intuitively impressionistically something like the shape of a thousand bicycle paths released under controlled conditions. You have like five seconds to do that. So while you're doing that, I I'm going to go back to what Jeff said about, you know, the uh, keep the searching for that perfect system. In your mind, what you're trying to do, I think, changed my mind, uh, is you think that you can actually design a bicycle that's just going to keep going. Aha! I, got, I finally got that bicycle. Whereas all of the bicycles you've ever seen have a certain path and a... and then if you did a thousand of them, it has a certain shape and that's what that bicycle design was. It had a life cycle, it had an expectancy yeah, and all that stuff. So just just keep in mind, um, let's see, um, let me know when you can, oops, let me, hold on, let's see, we're going to go with that screen, let me know when you can see that screen, can you see that screen? So that is the picture of a pathway of, I think it was 800, but we're going to call it 1,000. That's the pathway of 1,000 bicycles that were released from controlled conditions. Fascinating. That's not a random distribution like popcorn popping from it. No, it actually... You can actually see waves and patterns and themes and certain symmetries. Now, the bicycle did not change from path to path. What accounts for the, ver the variety of bicycle performance? The ecosystem. It wasn't the rider. It was subtle market conditions. Now, Make a list of 1 to 1,000 of all the variables that are in there affecting the pathway of the bicycle. Yeah, and there's more than that. So there's all that. The ecosystem and the starting condition of the test will tell you the, the boundary. In the, there is some moment in there when this thing moves from order to the edge of chaos. It's always being operated on by the laws of physics. But that's what chaos predicts, that when you have that many variables, even though they are all operating under the current laws of physics as we know them, the combinations are so uh, astronomically large that you get variation that looks like that. And the search for the perfect bicycle when you're what you're really doing is that you're neglecting I think the characteristics of the actual path of actual bicycles and learning from them in the search for the holy grail of that perfect design that you want to hold out hold out for hey so imagine if you did something like this if you thought about that just as a trader and you said what I'm gonna do is uh, 
when I release that bicycle from the doji, uh, maybe there's some kind of, uh, let's see, let me see if I can draw this right. Somewhere out about here, that thing mostly stays in the doji. And as soon as it, you, you draw the size of the blue box limit that you want, which I'm going to call the minimum manageable risk box in either direction, that every departure from crossing the blue line, it's, there's more volume outside of the blue box than in the, in the blue box. It has reliably departed from the controlled box of the doji of the starting conditions has become directional and then it becomes more directional what's not shown on here imagine what I would want to do if I was running that simulation is color code the ones that departed the box on one direction and then came back and crossed the red line the horizontal red line and finished on the other side I bet you there's fewer of them than depart the box and then finish on that side of the box. That's nothing more than the Z3 pinch or the super pinch. All driven by the size of the mountain that this thing came rolling down and the energy that it contained as it crossed the line. So why do you want to find something that is already in play? Because it gives you that kind of splatter pattern of energy being transferred into the ground through the connection of the tires rolling the interface between the bike and the ecosystem is the path that is traced on the surface that is the transfer of energy from the bike to the world which is receiving that energy back which it gave to it in the beginning in the form of the mountain which was all our hopes and dreams, and it was the size of the previous move or whatever. So that's why you want to find things that are in play. That is, that is an awesome thing to consider right there, by the way. You're not going to hear that anywhere else. But that's gold, what I just said, I think. So at the... Uh, Quantum Storytelling 12th Annual Conference, I ran an hour-long True Storytelling Circle where I did for them what we do together here for the last 30 weeks. And I said, um, the ability to create a mindful moment is really hard, but rewarding. And I was telling that to a room full of global academic experts in the art and science of storytelling. Do you know how hard it is to make storytellers just shut up and listen? It's hard, but they listened to me. And what I told them was, I said, we're going we're gonna to experience a mindful moment here through storytelling, and I want you guys all to think about the, the word that best describes your experience of the first three days of this amazing quantum storytelling experience. And there were many, many moving and interesting presentation. I said, whatever, uh, whatever word comes to your mind as you think about it to capture that, I want you to hold that word right in front of you and then think about an experience outside of this workshop, this conference, from your personal lived experience that beautifully captures the emotional intensity you feel about the word that you just used to describe this conference. So another personal story, but outside of the direct experience. So they're going to end up having two experiences. One was the quantum storytelling conference reminded them of a word, and then they found that word embodied in another emotionally compelling story from their life. Check or hold. So that's what I asked them to do. And then I said, what we're going to do is, in a minute, we're going to ring these chimes, and then we're going to take turns with the walking stick, talking stick, and tell your one-minute story uh, of personal emotional connection to this story. And here's what the rest of us is, are going to do. 
uh, we're just going to shut up and we're going to engage in deep listening and we're not going to judge, critique, advise, revise, recommend, process, direct, suggest, illuminate. Add, all we're going to do is shut up and listen and feel how that word and that story go all the way down to our feet and back up and resonate with deep memories that we have that we're not going to talk about. We're just going to notice them and remember them for reflection later on, but we're just going to sit in the silence and the truth of your stories and appreciate that. And when you're done telling your story, you're going to say, ah, ho, and I'm going to hit these little beautiful gong tones, and we're going to give that story 10 seconds of a head start to get its feet and go running out into the universe who is only trying to listen to true stories. And then we're going to move on to the next story. And when we're done telling stories, we're just going to ring that bell again. And then we'll be in the foyer and we can talk about whatever we want. But for a moment, can we just let the story be for once without processing it? and with no other purpose other than just to be the story that was told? Can we just do that? If we can, then we will have created a mindful moment in the center of that diagram, that little story that comes out of that little pink heart and creates a moment of space. And the reason that's important and the reason that it's hard to do is this. It's important because that's the only moment where you can make a difference and make a change, by the way. And the, pro the reason it's so hard is because of the problem of the past and the future. The problem of the past is there's just so much of it. And all of it's important, and everybody wants to tell you about it and why you need to know this before you can do that. Oh, but first, just the one more thing. There's so much of the past that should be attended to. I mean, it doesn't mean nothing, or does it? It means something apparently, because we're always talking about it. Oh, and the other problem is the future. And the problem with the future also is that there's just so much of it. Like every thought you had about what the future might be, could be, should be, will be, multiplied by every moment when you change your mind, times all the minds that have ever lived and are ever talking about things that are important, all of that is trying to fit into this moment to get your attention. So each of those things is like this huge red waves from the past coming forward, from the future coming back, all trying to crush that little person inside of you who's just trying to figure out what to do next with a moment of peace. Well, when you make that mindful moment and you send that little blue line down into the ground of virtues and values and intentions and your grounded reality, you, that's a source of strength. And then your visions and hopes and dreams and values in the high heavens of the sky remind you of what you're hoping it could be, and that's a source of strength. And from that groundedness and heavenly glory, you're pulling the energy that is in there to remind you that what you're doing in the mindful moment matters the most and that you can create that moment that lives inside the past, present, and future as part of a continuum, but is also its own little thing, its own little space within which you can make some changes up in this thing. So that was the setup that I gave them. Uh, and then we did the true story circle, as you guys have become accustomed to. And within 15 minutes, there were 10 people crying their eyes out because of the stories that had come up and had been shared and the moments of reality and the fact that nobody was helping them understand it or fix it or improve it or shape it. They were just sitting there in the presence of truth and just letting that be for a while. Uh, and that was pretty good. Which we know, because we've been sort of doing that. Well, I use that simply to say 
the other things that I was telling them about was our experience on the right-hand side of the uh, phenomenon of the true story circle, the safety, trust, and truth, the exchange of stories in sacred spaces that leads to opportunities out in the world after you depart the circle, when that story has had a chance just to be what it is, and off it goes, and then you kind of collect yourself and then move on to the next sorts of things that must be done in order to get on with it. But it's always connected to the memory that you created inside that sacred story space, which is an artifact and which happened. No matter what else happens in the future, that happened. And that gives you a sense of continuity and strength going forward. To Chun Long's comments about the process of innovation, this was the story that I told them from our three years of doing this stuff, was that the three-headed monster of transformation, if you will. First is that Fletcher creativity technique, which we're learning, the experiential learning of these little different moments and exercises and whatever, generates this individual energy of insight from a new space that simply taps into the evolutionary's brain desire to find something new. Ten million years of evolution have gone into creating a brain and sensory organs and sense-making system that seeks for novelty, not just to exploit an opportunity, but to find changes in the environment, because most of the time that'll kill you. Like your visual cortex developed to detect the difference between light and dark, because when you're just observing with your primitive eyeball the ecosystem and suddenly a shadow comes in, that's always bad. Well, most of the time it's bad because that's something that is now coming towards you and most of the time because it wants to eat you until proven otherwise. So detecting the difference in shading of lights is a survival instinct that's coded into your brain. And as you widen your peripheral vision, now the ability to detect motion on a static backdrop allows you to tells you, ah, there's something different. So we are geared to see differences. And the smallest difference that we can detect is the earliest opportunity to discover what is changing in the environment in order for us to do something. You decide or your brain will decide fight or flight based on all the other millions of variables that are going on. And because we're at the top of the food chain, apparently our brains are designed to do that. And because we can imagine future circumstances and visualize other outcomes and have a limited amount of delayed gratification and opposable thumbs and a social organization that allows us to communicate to overcome our individual physical weaknesses because we are a weak animal as a species but we have the ability to have strong social bonds that reward collaboration more than competition but with some competition it's called co opetition as a blend of cooperation and competition. So we have this ability to create tribes of practice that can communicate and distribute good ideas that work and multiply our ability to sense and respond what is working in the universe as we try to design bicycles that will resist the forces of chaos that make them crash so that they can perform on that curve better and then add a human for the motive power, knowing that they will add some variation to how the bike performs. So how you ride the bike now has something to do with the performance path of the bike. Like you got to learn how to hold your elbows in when you're riding for hours in order to reduce your aerodynamic profile. That makes a difference learning how to keep your knees and legs in a certain plane reduces your aerodynamic signature. And that promotes speed in the bike and makes you more stable when you go faster. The thinner your tires, the faster it goes, but the more quickly you lose the balance point when you go off 
the critical path, which is why bicycles fail eventually. Uh, so the left-hand side there, Shenlong, is what happens when you bring together pure Crutcher Fletcher creativity on the left side on a scale of one to seven of increasing novelty, and then the ability to bring that to market in a way that adds value practically, reliably, professionally, routinely, with lots of opportunity, that's feasibility and acceptability. Feasibility is the cost efficiency of bringing it to market, and acceptability reflects two different value judgments. One of them is, can I trade or perform this system in a such a way that it does not violate my sense of ethics and, in, and integrity and human values, honor, duty, service, and my acceptability of certain levels of risk, knowing what the risk profile of all the different outcomes look like, can I perform this system in a way that is making that risk profile acceptable? Either uh, if it's a expe positive expectancy, then I have to lower the amount of risk per iteration in order to get more iterations so that I never experience catastrophic loss when I get the worst possible controlled outcome and then and then there's some optimum level of risk I can trade oh yeah we know the, the uh, fortunes formula there's some optimum mathematical level of risk that I can trade it at to maximize the output of that system within the acceptable limits of risk that is connected to acceptability so when you blend those two drivers together the combination of Fletcher creativity and traders knowledge which is what we're trying to master the third head of this three-headed monster of transformational learning is the true storytelling circle that allows us to do the collaborative learning and fire together on all cylinders and contribute to our uh, collective success because of the shared trust, truth, and safety that we have, which leads to opportunity. So no matter what it is that you're trying to learn, if you bring together Fletcher creativity for individual novelty and enthusiasm and energy and insight, plus the true storytelling circle of collaborative, trusted, truthful, safe learning, plus the third head, which is any content that you want to master, what I found is it works with, oh yeah, soccer knowledge, traders knowledge, soldier knowledge, leadership knowledge, anything that you put into there as the, as the technical component of what it is that you're trying to learn. If you add to that effort of learning, the combination of individual Fletcher treatment for creativity plus the true storytelling circle for collaborative learning, you have a recipe for accelerated learning that is impossible to stop. The, the return on, on effort, I want you to map the R multiple of accelerated collaborative learning that features Fletcher's nitroglycerin fuel plus true storytelling, rapid determination of efficacy and applicability and opportunity, plus just grounded in rock-solid trader's knowledge. Every iteration that you go through, every venture that you take each week to learn, documented in your learning journal, is an R multiple of learning. Hey, you tried this on and studied this and you got that kind of result, and what was the maximum amount of learning that you could get out of performing the reflection of the plan, prepare, execute, and assess? That's not just for trading, my friends. That is the model for accelerated learning. I'm planning to learn. I prepare to learn. I execute the learning plan of drawing the line on the piece of paper like Ken told me to do to experience the single path of a free, free bicycle over ground and then connecting that to the larger insight. And then you're going to reflect on this when you uh, take a look at that little picture again 
and what it all means. And then you're going to cycle through that on your own individual hamster wheel and generate all kinds of insights that you're going to document in your learning journal the same way that you document the learned lessons from each trading case study and you talk about it like you don't say well I'm kind of embarrassed to show this no you're not well maybe you are but that's the energy of learning and courage that generates collaborative learning in a safe and trusted culture of learning so Chun Long Lee that is the diagram of the innovation process that you're going to draw for you that allows you to go from the aha moment of insight to the reflective considerations in column two to the experimental test in column three to the discovery of the results and reflection upon it in column four that's the four-part learning journal that we talk about and it goes on to your master task list for other things to follow up on and you get to them in some kind of prioritized list that you decide upon it's never ending then and only then are you preparing to learn by quickly pushing to the boundaries of what the lesson contains in the same way that you launch a bicycle of experimentation and follow its path and then document it and and add it to the list of other paths that you've traced and then you learn something about the bicycle and its pathways through time and space. And then you can learn something from it. And then you realize, oh yeah, that's the bicycle is the metaphor for just another mechanical trading system following the rules. You have to accumulate enough N to be able to say anything sensible about the performance of the system without changing the variable of the human driver on it each and every time it's always a pathway of one and you can't learn anything systematic about an N of one you can only describe it and what it felt like to be on it but you can't do anything systematic with it you can learn something about the sense maker that's riding the bicycle that's trying to infer systematic information with a bunch of independent experiments with an N of one that tells you a lot about the person trying to conduct experiments that way more than what the system is you're learning something about the person that cannot recreate conditions in an experimental control group so I mean so be who you are but also reflect that one of the things that you can do is use bicycles as leverage for your insights and let the bicycle do the work in the same way that you let the trading system rules do the work up until the point where you've got to make some decisions at the risk boundary about how much more risk to lock in or to take or how many gains to take that's where you're getting paid to make judgments in a pretty good mechanical system is when to start moving open risk to your side of the ledger and how much how, what's the window in which you're going to allow that bicycle and rider to continue to wobble and just remember you're, you're training a monkey to ride a bicycle they can be trained to do that but they're always going to be a monkey on a bicycle and you got to protect that monkey from falling off the bicycle and that's you taking care of the vulnerable naive trusting monkey who just wants to please you and to do well to get a banana so as you start thinking about all the members of your team and who's on the team and the roles that they play take a look at that little flash card that was added in there and those guys that are on the bottom of the team the chief of staff the designer the architect the framer the trader the fireman the assistant manager the sniper the accountant the scientist all of those members of the team all doing their part to make a difference between your performance and that of a random number generator I I take the position that we are not random number generators but that we can do something with skill that makes a difference uh, in the performance of systems and that that thing that we can do is tradable trainable learnable and provides a persistent professional edge in 
And so that's my hypothesis. Uh, so that's what I wanted to say on my little story for my week in progress. Uh, Aho. <laughs> <laughs>